Introducing today's speaker is uh, Joe Belknap, and uh, Joe Belknap serves as the Senior Director of the Administrative Computing at Utah Valley University, where he was honored with the IT Award of Excellence by the Board of Trustees. In addition to his technical experience, Joe brings over 30 years of extensive business experience to UVU and is, is a partner with the Green Lee Center for Servant Leadership. His, board, or his broad business background includes finance, human resources, oper, operations, marketing, and executive administration. Joe has, has more than 10 years of consulting experience and received a commitment a Commitment to Excellence Award. Uh, Belknap is a published author and has a master's degree in organizational leadership from Gonzaga University. He recently received, or he recently graduated from uh, Disney's Institute Leadership Excellence Program and is recognized as one of, as one driven to continuously improve. Please welcome Joe Belknap. Got one right here. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. I'm doubly wired. I've got two mics on, so hopefully you can all hear me, and that might be a good idea too. It worked for a second, Joe. Can you guys hear back there? Can you hear? It went out. I heard it on the speaker, and then it kind of It went out? I can project, but I'd rather not. Can you hear me now? Oh no. Okay. You're good? As long as I don't move? Okay. I'm usually a little more dynamic than this, but no. Um, oh, thank you. I normally, thank you, Bruce and Cal. Aloha. Okay, tough audience. <laughs> Hola, okay. By a show of hands, how many of you compete with Disney? How many of you are in, the, in or hoping to be in the service industry? Okay, wow. Bruce, you're not, oh, okay, just, just checking. Okay, Robert Greenleaf came up with the term and coined the phrase servant leadership. And it begins with the desire to serve. And then comes the natural feeling that one wants to lead. And then conscious choice brings you to aspire to lead, but this is the test. Do those being served as persons, do they grow? Do they become more, while being served, healthier, freer, wiser, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? That's the test. If you're doing it right, that is the litmus, and that'll let you know that you're doing it well. Now, what we're going to cover, and I promised the cameraman that I'm not going to move around too much, but, no, okay. <laughs> He is, he is not sleeping back there. We're going to first cover the four factors of business success, and this is regardless of what business you're going into. And then we're going to also go over the different phases of perspectives for the organization. And then we're going to really hit the levels of service, and then servant leadership is the apex of what we're going to talk about. Now, some people have referred to change happens a little differently. They use a little shorter word, but it does happen. And the three things about change is it's constant, it's inevitable, and it's essential. If you get nothing else from this lecture, I want you to remember, nothing great has ever happened without change. Now, let's do a little historical analysis of the workforce. Way back when, everyone was either a hunter or a gatherer. You went out, you got your food. You were either successful or you won't. 
Then came the agricultural age and people became farmers. People were putting seeds in the ground, planting them and, and claiming to get 50 times more from what they did than these hunter-gatherers. Well, were they right? This is participation time. They were right. And that resulted in a 90% downsizing of all hunter-gatherers, okay? But then we got into the industrial, where efficiency was the thing. They produced 50 times more than the farmers, to the extent that today, only 2% of the workforce are farmers, and yet we produce more than they used to. But now we're in the information and knowledge age. We now produce 10,000 times more than the industry age. And the big problem that people are finding is they're trying to do things the way they used to do them and finding that they're not quite working. Well, why? It's the speed has increased dramatically. So the biggest challenge to managing change is the instability, uncertainty, and stress. Because if you don't manage this change, you're going to be left with instability, uncertainty, and stress. And a lot of people say, what's the difference? And it's like, at least you have a bit of a handle of how much instability, how much uncertainty, and most importantly, how much stress you have. There's three ways to deal with change. Reactive, adaptive, proactive. What are most people and or companies? Does anybody know about how many, what percentage? Well, not quite that bad, but it's about 80. And about 15% are adaptive. And then we have those few that are proactive. What would you rather be? OK. Now, I've just gone on a little tour of change, but what we're asking for and what we're seeking is a transformation. We want something different, because change is just substituting one thing for another, this for that. But a transformation, that's to cause this metamorphosis in who you are and your state of being. It's like when a, a carriage maker is transformed into an automobile factory. They are different. They function differently. And the reason we're bringing this up is there is an impending change coming. You're approaching this. Believe it or not, there's a declining workforce out there. Almost two-thirds of men and women would like to reduce the number of hours they work in a week. Anyone in this group not part of that? You and you just come up. I have a really good therapist that I can... <laughs> because how many of us don't want to go to a job that requires 60 to 70 hours a week? We don't. You want to have a life. You want to, well, pretend you have a life, right? Also, when they were doing a glass ceiling study, they were trying to find out how this had improved the number of women in the workforce. This totally blew their minds. 15% increase of the number of stay-at-home moms. And I'm not talking about women that work out of their home. These are, I am now leaving the workforce and I'm just going to stay at home. They did not expect to see this. And this is a big one. And when I started teaching this five years ago, 2010 was like forever away. But how many weeks before we hit 2010? And this is what we're having. Half the workforce is getting ready for retiring. There's close to 80 million jobs and only 44 million people ready to take over them. So now let's get into the four factors of business success. And they are productivity, profitability, retention, and customer satisfaction. And it doesn't matter what business you're in or what you're doing, these are your dipsticks. If these things are being handled well, everything else is fine. And I'm just going to go on this briefly because Bruce has asked that I stick to servant leadership a bit, but I just want to set the tone for it. 50% of professional workers' skills become outdated in three to five years. Now, when I am speaking to a business class, I can just simply say, are you still doing the same things that you were doing for your job five years ago? No. And it doesn't matter what they're doing. My wife was a nurse. She's scared to death to go back into nursing because some of the things they used to do are now illegal because they found out that it just wasn't the right way to do it. It's, it's constantly changing, constantly evolving, and that's the way it is for everyone. 
Now, I spend a lot of time with IT. When we spend $1 on IT training, it brings us $30 in productivity back. Try to get that from a bank. I don't care what CD it is. You just can't do that. Profitability. In the computing sector, every dollar invested in technology certification yields $300 in return. That's a pretty good investment. The problem is, a lot of times you're going to be taught that this is what? This is an asset. This is an asset. I'm a what? I'm a liability. You've passed your class, but please don't do this in business. Who's your biggest asset? The people. Okay, don't ever forget that. An increase in $680 per individual in training gets you about six percentage points return on investment. Again, try to do that at any bank. Try to do that with a lot of business investing. Invest in your people. <clears throat> now, the attrition rate. Does anybody know what the average attrition rate is at a company? Good to know, especially if you're trying to find new jobs. That's not bad. It's about 18. It's about 18 percent. But at the best places to work, it's only six places. And one thing that I will point out, two of these companies in the last 45 years have never had anyone leave for any reason other than retirement or death. That's not bad. No layoffs. Because here's the biggest thing that a lot of companies have to look at. The cost to replace a customer service rep is about $18,000. That's what they're making, but it costs about $58,000 to replace them. Now, let me ask you a question. The higher up on the food chain, so to speak, that this person is, the more money they make, is the ratio stay the same or does it get bigger? Much bigger, up to 10 times it can cost you to replace that person. What are those two companies? I'll talk to you later, <laughs> okay? Because it is shifting, but one of them's in Minnesota if you really want to, you know. Which also says a lot about the company. Because how many people have Minnesota marked down as my favorite place to visit? <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there once. I'm still having therapy, but. Anyway, the thing I want to point out on this is, say for example, if Robin, my assistant, were to come up to me and say, I'm leaving, don't get any ideas. <laughs> I'm leaving. It would actually be better for me to say, how about I give you an 84% bonus instead, if you'll stay. And guess what? I'll break even. Because I'm going to spend that money to try to replace that person. That's the perspective you have to have. Now, the average, the cost of turnover in a company is between three and a half and six percent of the, their budget. If it's a two million dollar budget, then this is part of what's costing that company. They're all looking for places to save. Now, this is very important. Retention is not just keeping people. Because, let's face it, there are some people that were, if they were to come into my office and said, I'm leaving, I would go inside. Hallelujah, you know, but, you know, I would not say, okay, I'll give you a bonus or what can I do to keep you because, let's face it, there are some companies who just say, well, we only have a 4% attrition rate and that's because they're keeping all the people that they wish they would leave, okay? So don't think of retention just as not having the turnover. Everyone agree with that? If the only reason you're going for a job is be to make more money, then you will not be happy. Job satisfaction is not derived from more money. What they found is more money just makes you more of what you already are. If you're unhappy, you'll just be a little more unhappy. If you're making a lot more, you'll be a lot more unhappy. Primary job satisfaction indicator is the work environment. And that's where servant leadership is going to come in. Hourly pay was shown to have almost no impact. As long as you're making enough to make ends meet, that wasn't the big factor. It was your environment. Now, customer satisfaction. Curiosity, novelty, well, that brings people in, but how do you keep them coming back? 
that's how they're treated and how they're served. Now business practices and procedures can be immensely simplified so that they can become like Nordstrom's, whose entire employee handbook fits on a five by eight card. Anybody been hired and read the employee handbook? I remember one place had one that was about that thick and, and everything, but their whole handbook fits on a card and conveniently on a slide. Welcome to Nordstrom's. We're glad to have you with our company. Our number one goal is to provide outstanding service, customer service. Set both your personal and professional goals high. We have great confidence in your ability to achieve them. Side note, or we wouldn't have hired you. Nordstrom rules, rule number one. Use your good judgment in all situations. There will be no other rules. Please feel free to ask your department manager, your store manager or division manager any question at any time. That's the employee handbook. How many of you would like to work at this kind of environment? Okay. Now let me tell you one little thing. It is absolutely frenetic. I couldn't handle it. I'm a little more laid back and they are very go, go, go. Bruce, you'd love it. <laughs> but here's the thing. Because of that environment, 50% of people leave in the first year. Because they just can't handle that type of environment. And people go, well, what about their attrition rate? Oh my word, 50% in the first year. But from then on, it's 2%. So they just have an ongoing training for the entry level people and it's not a big deal. They don't spend any more because they do it every single month. And these aren't people that are fired. These are people that just leave. So the tipping point is that relatively minor changes in our external environment can dramatically affect how we behave and who we are. For example, clean up graffiti, and all of a sudden people who would otherwise commit crimes won't. This is what they did in New York. They tried to double the police force. Crime went up. They started cleaning up the graffiti, crime went way down. Why do you suppose that is? You, have, you feel less justification for stealing or committing crime having lived in Detroit for nine months with all the graffiti and broken down houses. It was easy to pick up something in somebody's yard just because you would think it would be stolen by someone else if you didn't. Yeah, it was just the way it was. The other, the other message that was sent is, wait, if they're paying attention to graffiti, they really must be paying attention to the more serious things. And people just stop doing it. The other thing is, tell a seminarian that he has to hurry, and all of a sudden he starts to ignore bystanders in obvious distress, even though that's what he's all about. Just tell him, please hurry. Little tiny things. So. What we need to do is arrange everything so that the strong have something to yearn for and the weak nothing to run from. And why? Because nothing is insignificant. So we've got to wait, make wise decisions. If you don't act, you will be acted upon. Change happens. So if you're not making part of that change, it will happen regardless of what you do. The other thing is there's no such thing as standing still. We're all on an escalator that's going down. And if we're not moving forward, where are we going to end up? It's on the slide. No. <laughs> OK, thanks. Just making sure you're here. OK. So the thing is, is you've got to do it right so you don't have to do it again. And also, what you allow, you encourage. Remember that always. If you allow it to happen, you're actually encouraging it to happen. So the other thing I put up there is identify and treat causes, not just symptoms. For example, uh, I have a daughter who is suffering from many illnesses and for quite some time the doctor was treating the symptoms. This is to take care of the stomach, this is to take care of the headache, this is to, and it kind of worked, but it kept coming back. The problem was we found she had severe depression. So instead of taking the, those for the symptoms, we started to treat the depression. Guess what happened to the symptoms? They went away. And unless you're taking care of the causes, 
your symptoms are never going to go away. Okay, here's the test portion. There's five mountains in Europe higher than the Matterhorn. Name two. The Alps, the entire mountain range. He's probably covered some of them right there. Uh, could you be, what? Mont Blanc. Yes, for those that speak French. Mont Blanc. I've got it as Mont Bianco. Okay. Uh, the one that has symbols that can't be printed, let alone pronounced. Um, Mount Ararat, Mont Rosa, Dom Servino. Why did I put this up here? It's like he was reading my mind. <laughs> Whoa, thank you. You don't. If I showed a picture of, of the Matterhorn up here, even if it was the one from Disneyland, you would all recognize it, you would know it, okay? So you don't have to be the highest to be world class. Okay, is it possible to hold 100 tons of water without any visible means of support? How? And I didn't even have it clicked, so yeah. Build a cloud, and can we do that? Can we make clouds? Can we seed clouds? Ski resorts do quite well with that, huh? Okay, now we're gonna talk about the levels of service, or what I refer to as the states of being. Level one, that's where you're meeting acceptable minimum standards. You're just saying, okay, I'm meeting your needs. And what I'm gonna compare this with is the automobile industry and how each of these do in that realm. So at level one, well, in the auto industry, the first stage you could get any color as long as it was black and it got you from A to B. That was pretty much it. And they were wildly successful until something happened. Until somebody came along at level two. And that's when the driving force becomes answering the client's wants. And this is when they started to AM, FM radios, ashtrays, variety of colors from which to choose. Let me ask you, what happens to a level one company when a level two company comes along in the same industry? Yeah, they've got to become a level two as well or they will go down. You can't stay a level one very long as long as there's competition. Now, no matter what level you want to be at, there's 10 rules of business success. Always wait a split second after a person finishes talking before you speak. Listen with your entire body. How many of you have been to Disneyland? Okay. My daughter, who attends UVU, it, she wanted to be Aurora. Anybody not know who Aurora is? Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty. There's one problem, though. She made it to the final eight. But there is one problem, and it's amazing she made it to the final eight, even though she had this problem. My daughter is five foot seven. Aurora can only be five foot six. Why? <laughs> the dress. No, I think they have enough money to buy a new dress. <laughs> Who's she talking to 90% of the time? <laughs> Little kids. They've got this restriction. And have you noticed? how the princesses talk to the little kids. They listen with their entire body. They're down like this. They're at the, you know, parents, that's okay. They're paying the bill. They've already, you know, bought the, but they're paying the attention to the little children so that they can do that. They're listening with their entire body. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and they're looking all over the room? They may hear every word you say, but are they listening? No, okay. Be positive even if you have to use your imagination, okay? And speak well of others, even if you have to lie, okay? That was a little bit of humor, but it's okay. It's just, hang on. You'll get it in a little bit, okay. There we go. Memorize names. What is the number one pe favorite thing for people to hear? Their own name, name. Mm -hmm. and preferably pro pronounced correctly. Okay, never try to impress. The effort always shows and it diminishes you. 
and never make your conversations, particularly on cell phones, public. This is the part where I diverge a little bit. I carry my cell phone with me at all times, and if it rings, which it has done, even when I was presenting in front of a thousand people, I answer it. Why would that be? And I'll just try to be brief with this. I missed my dad's passing by 15 minutes. Okay? The phone call that tells you of that type of thing or that your daughter or child has been seriously injured, let me tell you something. You won't recognize the number. It is that important, but they won't leave a message and they won't call back. So I always answer my phone. I have a code and if I pick it up and answer it a certain way, they know what I'm doing and they can then know that, okay, I gotta get off the phone quickly. And that's the way we work it out. But the point I'm trying to make is, people are blown away. I don't have caller ID at home. I always answer the phone because I never know really where it's coming from and I don't wanna make that judgment beforehand. That was my own personal thing. Praise but never flatter. Praise makes people feel good, but flattery makes them feel manipulated. And don't you always wake up every morning saying, gee, I sure hope somebody manipulates me today. Yeah, that's what we started out today, right? No. Are you guys with me? Okay, Rachel, even if you have to make it up, laugh. Okay, no, just kidding. And a simple rule whenever you're in doubt, be kind. Now, I know I put up their 10 rules of business manners, but so just do these. There. Okay? And that'll be fine. Now, level, thank you for that gallant effort. Uh, <laughs> now, level three, that's where your surveys are asking, okay, how can we improve? Well, it doesn't do you any good because the customer has run out of ideas. So to differentiate yourself, you've got to make a leap to making the driving force be surprising the customer. And as a result, you become imagination driven. When Walt Disney created, not just conceived of Disneyland, he entered the third level because he went beyond what the customers said they needed or could have even imagined. What happened when Walt Disney went for a loan for Disneyland? No way. You're going to charge people just to get in? That's going to fail. Right. Okay. When the auto industry entered the third level, that's when they created heated car seats, they turned the, the stereo console slightly towards the driver, and they also came up with these cavernous trunks that seem bigger than the car itself. I mean, here you are in a Toyota Corolla, and you can have a camp out for three in the back of the trunk. It's just, how did they do that? Now, let me ask you, did anyone ask for that? No but it's what allowed them to take a Camry and put a Lexus symbol on it and charge $40,000 more, okay? Because at level three, you offer the possible, not what others need or want, but what they would love. And when they love it, they get it, they want it, they go after it. So the question of what has been successful, well, that just leads you to the old answers, and that just says, let's copy or refine but we're not gonna be innovating. So don't ask this question. What you've gotta do, never mind what people say they want. No one ever asked for ATMs. No one ever asked for heated car seats, Disneyland, and outside of a few thousand techies, no one asked for PCs. How many people have a computer at home? How many have more than one? You need help. No, <laughs> I have three. So anyway, but. Everyone's heard the story about the deck person who said no one would ever want a personal computer. Yeah, that's why deck is so famous right now. You've all heard it. Yeah, she's like, who the heck is deck? Digital equipment. I won't get into that. So you got to ask and keep asking yourself, what would the people love? Now, when you master this level three, then you're ready for leadership nirvana, which is servant leadership. When I say airline industry, what do you think of? 
Thank you, I didn't even have to spell it. Bankruptcy. Now, I'm going to add 9-11 to that equation. Better or worse? Okay. I'm going to tell you, there's one airline out there that actually increased their sales and improved their productivity during 9-11 and is nowhere near bankruptcy. Who is it? JetBlue until they got rid of their leader. Southwest. Southwest. Anybody know why? Well, do you know why? Go! <laughs> okay. They practice servantly. Thank you. He, he can read. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. They're the only ones that practice servant leadership. JetBlue used to, and then they ousted their CEO. Yep. And they stopped doing it, and now how are they? They're looking into bankruptcy. They're blue. They're blue, yeah. Okay, space is not empty. Has anybody heard of field theory? Any of you going into field theory? Quantum physics? Okay, we'll do a little, little example in a bit here. Field theory says that there's these fields that affect how we are and who, how we behave. For example, when you go to a restaurant, Tell me if this is true or not. You go into a restaurant, you don't have to look at the menu, you don't have to really look around too much, but you can feel whether or not they do or don't have good service and or food. You can feel it. No one can explain it, you can't see it, but they understand why. And it's the same thing in your work environment. If you have an environment that is just oozing with this creative juices, that starts happening when people are brought into it. Same thing with negative, but we won't talk about that. We'll talk about the positive. Now, let's just do a little exercise. Everyone stand up, please. This way, at the end, I can say that you were all lifted up. Anyway, um, take a step to your right, go back. See, and you were all moved, too. Anyway, um, okay, touch the person next to you. And you were all touched. See, if nothing else, you can say that in this presentation. All right. Now, I want everybody to stand with your feet shoulder, shoulder width apart. Be comfortable. Give yourself room. I don't want any lawsuits from this little exercise. Now, that's close, but not like that. Now, watch me carefully. What I'm going to ask you to do is take your finger like this. Don't do it quite yet. And I'm just going to ask you to turn. It doesn't matter which way you turn. Just turn, keep your feet on the ground, and just pivot at, the, at your waist. And go as far as you are comfortably able to go. No stretched ligaments, no, none of that, please. Just do that right now. Everyone just point, turn, make a note of where you went. OK, come back. OK, hands down, close your eyes. This is the fun part. You do need to close your eyes. I think I know your name. You, yeah. OK. Close your eyes. Don't put your hands up. I just want you to visualize this whole thing. Pretend that you are putting your hands up. Picture yourself doing that. Picture yourself turning again, just like you did before. You're going, Bruce, put your hand down. You're going to, <laughs> thanks. You're going to go ahead and turn. You're going past where you went before. You're turning completely around. You're not just pointing at the back of the room. You're now completely turned around. Not once, twice. You're just like an owl. You can keep going around as many times as you want. OK, open your eyes. Let's do it again. Point. Everybody turn. Anybody not go further than they did before? Okay, here's the card of that therapist. No, <laughs> seriously. Okay, sit down. Thank you. What did I do? Why did I do this? It's a visualization exercise. I do this with basketball teams. We did this with a junior high basketball team where half of them couldn't even touch the net. Some of them could come close to the rim. We got everyone jumping three inches higher after one hour. And here's the cool thing. Three weeks later, not having to do the exercise again, they were still jumping three inches higher. Can I tell a story? Please do. Okay, um, I'm just, no, go ahead. Oh, 
Um, Go ahead. One time before, Do you want a mic? I, um, before I left to Brazil, I was just shooting around, just shooting free throws or whatever. And um, I was making about 60% of my shots. Okay, and so I'll just stand up. Oh. And so I decided to um, use the visualization, which Bruce always talked about in class when I took his class a couple years ago. And so every time before I would shoot a free throw, I would just um, picture in my mind, like from a perspective, like I was watching another person and I was watching myself from the back, like with my form, perfect form, and then the ball going in, like touching the net, like touching no rim, nothing, just like going straight in swish. And um, so I decided to shoot the free throws again and um, I made 10 in a row. And this isn't something that just I do or, or Bruce does. This is also done by NASA and it's done by Olympic athletes in the in the Olympic Games so that they can get that just that much quicker. Now, going forward, everybody says servant leadership, well, you've got to be the follower first. That's what we talked about. So here's how you be an effective follower. Be proactive. Gather the facts. You've got to see things as they really are. Not how people are telling you they are, but how they really are. And you've got to seek wise counsel. Don't think that you have to do it all by yourself. And play by the rules. Whatever institution you're in, whatever class you're in, you do need to play by the rules of the class. The business that you're in, things like that. Play by those rules. And persuade by speaking the language of the organization. I'm in IT. I don't speak techies very much. I don't speak acronyms. I can speak it, I understand it, but the reason is, is I'm dealing a lot with people who speak this language called English. And they're much more responsive when I speak to them without all those acronyms about what they do and don't want. So speak to them in the language of the organization. Now, what that means is some organizations have little acronyms. It's best to learn those so that you are ma making sure that you understand that what you're saying is what they are understanding. Now, prepare your courage to go over heads when absolutely necessary. And then take collective action. What do I mean by that? You need to persuade people to join you with your idea and your vision. Or be prepared to stand alone. People always ask, so how do you be a leader and a follower? How's that possible? Well, when you turn the pyramid, and when I say the pyramid, you know, the hierarchical order of a business or anything, you've got the CEO and then this. When you turn that pyramid upside down, who's at the top of the organization? Yeah, the customer contact people. Now, here's the other question. Who's really at the top of the organization? Very good, the customers. So this one change, although it seems minor, it makes a major difference. And the difference between, is between who is responsible and who is responsive. Now, in the old way of doing things, then the boss is always responsible and the staff is supposed to respond to the boss, right? But when you turn this upside down, then the roles get reversed. Now, the people become responsible and the job of management is to be responsive to those people. My job is not to be the quarterback. My job is not to be the running back. It's not to be the wide receiver. My job as the senior director is to be the offensive lineman. I am going to pancake any obstacle that gets in their way. That's my job. Because they're the ones that know what needs to be done and we're going to make sure that we respond to that. And remember that the word responsible means able to respond. These are the 10 main characteristics of servant leadership. You've got to listen. And again, listen with your body. Don't just hear what they're saying, listen. And as you listen, you have to create empathy and understand what it is that they're trying to tell you, what it is that they're trying to say, where are they coming from? Healing, what does healing have to do with business? The word heal means to make whole. 
if things are missing, if there's a part of somebody's life that's not quite there, yeah, Bruce. To serve a need. What's that? To serve a need, close a gap. Exactly. Fill that hole. Make it make it whole. You've got to have awareness, and this is where I said you've got to know what what's really happening. Be aware. Use persuasion. Most people just give orders, but always use the persuasion. And this doesn't mean that you just allow them to do what they want to do. There are times where it's not just do your job, it's do the jo job the way you're being asked to do it. And if you're uncomfortable doing your job the way you're being asked to do it, sometimes the best way is to leave. Conceptualization, that's where you can see what needs to be and what needs to become and you're able to put it together so that you see it before you in the big picture at all times. And use your foresight because where you are, how many of you want to have the campaign slogan of, I want to be exactly the way I am right now, forever? No, continuously improve and everyone can. Now, I use this word stewardship. A lot of people think it's ownership. What's the difference? One more time. Stewardship, you're, you're on to it, yeah. Ownership, it's mine. Doesn't matter what happens, it's mine. Have you ever given a great present to a little kid and it's theirs and they turn around and immediately destroy it? It is theirs, but it, with stewardship, your number one goal is to make sure that whatever it is becomes better. And if you have stewardship over the people that you're working with and for, then you're just trying to make them all better. You've got to be committed to the growth of people, and you have to build the community. So. Possible or impossible to reach the summit of Mount Everest, physically standing on top in under 24 hours. Now think about it. Uh, and alive. <laughs> Helicopter won't get that high. It is impossible, and I will tell you why. Altitude sickness. Anybody aware of what that is? Okay. When you get up there, what happens to your lungs? If you're not acclimatized, they fill up with liquid. And what happens when your lungs fill up with liquid? It is not back into the womb. Yeah, you die. There is no cure. There is no antidote. There's nothing you can do. The only thing you can do with the onset of altitude sickness is get back down quick. Okay, And this is the way it is with these levels we've been talking about, because you can't bypass any of the preliminary camps. If your area or organization is level one, and you try to say, okay, tomorrow we're going to be level four, what's going to happen? You, can't, you won't be able to do it. Why? You're just not comfortable that way. So make sure you're comfortable at the lower levels before attempting to go up to the higher ones. If not, you don't reach the summit. So, here we go with level one. Level one, you're just dealing with needs. And people are asking, okay, what's in it for me? What do I get? These are the questions. Do I know what is expected of me at work? And do I have the materials and equipment I need to do my work right? If you can ask your employees this and rate it on a scale of one through five, and for the most part, you're three and above, great, you're level one. But if you have one person that's, that's a one or says, no, we're not doing this, or I don't know what's expected of me, what are you? Even if it's one out of 10, one out of 100, you haven't re attained it. You're not there. Now, level two, you're dealing with wants. And they're asking, OK, what do I give? And at work, do I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day? And in the last seven days, have I received recognition or praise for doing good work? I had one person say, well, what if they don't do any good work? Remember to keep it fictional. 
but be positive. Does my supervisor or someone at work seem to care about me as a person? And is there someone at work that encourages my development? And again, if you can answer these four questions and everybody responds positively, three or above, then yes, you're at level two. And you can move forward. Level three, we're dealing with purpose and the possible. And this is where people start asking, do I belong here? At work, do my opinions seem to count? And does the mission purpose of my company make me feel my job is important? There are some companies that I could not work for, period, simply because I don't believe in the product or I don't believe in their way of doing things. And there's no way I can feel comfortable working for them. That's not to say that what they're doing is wrong, it's just that I wouldn't be comfortable there. So the other question is, are my coworkers committed to doing quality work? And do I have a best friend at work? And again, you ask these questions and you see where you're at there. But level four is the summit. That's where we're dealing with altruism. And how can we all grow? In the last six months, has someone at work talked to me about my progress? And this last year, have I had opportunities at work to learn and grow? So in summary, there's four factors of business success, but they're a reflection of the overall service level. And the organizational service level is composed of the individual service level. And an organizational level of service cannot be any higher than the lowest individual. If you have a bunch of people at level three, but one at level one, what is your organization? Right. Now what happens is, if individuals that are a low le lower level than everyone else, they're either gonna transform or they're gonna leave. Remember what happens at Nordstrom. If they can't handle that level, they will leave. They're either gonna change and adjust or they'll leave. Now, Conversely, anybody that's higher, they're either going to say, okay, are you trying to get to a higher level? If so, I'm going to help you. If not, what are they going to do? Leave. And that's where you get into a lot of companies where the best people are the ones leaving. Now, to wrap this up, let's suppose that there's a clothing store and they're at these different levels, and someone comes in and says, I want a set of tires. This is a clothing store. Now, at level one, they're thinking scarcity. They want a piece of the pie. That's it. These people have to work. And they would reply, maybe not this nicely, we don't carry tires. Okay? But someone at level two, they're dealing with limits still, but they want most or all of the pie. And these people get to work. They still don't look forward to Monday mornings and the alarm and things like that, but they get to work. They would simply say, I'm sorry, we don't carry tires. You might try looking up in the phone book or something like that. Level three, you're dealing with abundance. There's plenty of pie for everybody. Not worried about it. These people love to work. I had a job once that I joked around and said I would do it for free. For three months I did. That's why I'm not there anymore. Um, but I did. I just loved what I was doing. And these are the people that they don't have that, but let me show you who does. And they might even call ahead and say, hey, I've got somebody I'm sending over and they, do you have this tire in stock? Okay, but level four they are unlimited. There are no limits. And they believe that if the pie's not big enough, what do you do? Just make it bigger. And these people don't work. They just don't view what they do as work. It's just what they are and how they do things. This person would say, come back in 30 minutes and I'll have the tires for you. Goes out and gets them from the other place, brings them back, sells them for exactly what they paid. Yes? You know Harrods in London, world's largest department store, world mm -hmm. famous and stuff? Mm -hmm. And they are, they're known for anything you want, period, call Harrods. Mm -hmm. It's expensive, but you can get it. Mm -hmm. And I was in there talking to one of the folks, and 
I said, yeah, that, that happens quite a bit. We had a call. We needed 600 pounds of sausage flown out to a cruise ship. And they made it happen. Yeah. And I've been to a restaurant in San Francisco where they said, if you're sick and you don't like what's on the menu, tell us what you want. We told them. They went grocery shopping and made it. Yeah. It's really amazing that um, they'll get you a pink Lamborghini, that whatever you want, whenever you want it, they just say, we'll fix it, we'll make it work. Yeah, I'm not making this up. This actually happened. Okay. Now, I've got a question to ask. In this transaction, did the company make money? No. In the big picture? Absolutely. Because let me tell you, the person goes home with their tires and everything like that. Then it comes gardening season. They need some manure. So, honey, I'm going to go get some manure. Well, where are you going? The clothing store. Right? Because that's where they were treated wonderfully. Now, I want to tell you guys something before I ask the next bunch of questions. How many of you have been to Disneyland? Let's see the hands. Raise them up way high. I have a serious addiction. I have annual passes to Florida. Okay? Not just Anaheim. Okay? But every, how many that didn't raise their hands have at least seen a Disney movie? Okay? That didn't raise, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, she was visualizing, okay? No. <laughs> and the thing I want to point out is when you go into a restaurant, when you go anywhere, when you do anything, subliminally, you compare it with your best and worst experience. You rate it every single time. Every time. Now, how many people have been exposed to Disney's quality of service? Everybody. So guess what? When I asked the question, how many of you compete with Disney? I want to see the hands. Every single one of you compete with Disney because whenever you have a contact, have you heard my story about the popcorn line? Bruce, yes, no? Okay. Going to a movie, this guy gets up there and he's in the line and we've all had this kind of an experience where how long is the line? It's tremendously long. There's, what, two minutes before the movie starts, and you're up there, and all you want is popcorn and a drink, and you're like this. Finally, the guy in front of you gets up there to, to the clerk, and he just kind of goes, now let me see. He's been in line for 25 minutes, but now let me see what I want. Well, this person couldn't resist and made a few... Uh, remarks about IQs and very low numbers and things like that. You know, no big deal. They were going to different movies. Well, guess what? The next day, this person had a job interview. <laughs> Lo and behold, they would meet again. The same person that he was referring to low numbers and IQs was the person across the desk that he was interviewing with. Long interview? No. Very short. Got the job? No way. You never know. You just never know. So how many of you are in the service industry? Every single one. Of, the only people who aren't in the service industry are people who don't have customers. And guess what? You're not in any industry if you don't have customers. Okay? And that should be all of us. So are there any questions? I just gave a two-hour presentation in 45 minutes as you asked. <laughs> okay. I, I hope that wasn't the only reason. I'm done. Oh, thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay, yes. Don't even mention Walmart. Have you been to Walmart? <laughs> your greeters. Thank you. Widen your aisles. Anyway, no. <laughs> Disney is 
basically the one that people, everybody points to. Uh, let me just give you one local, Larry H. Miller. How much did Larry Miller know about movie theaters? I mean, when, to be honest, he had, when he bought the property, he had no idea what he was going to do with it. And then somebody said, we'll do a movie theater. And guess what? Nobody would give him money. Why wouldn't they give Larry Miller money to do a movie theater? He had no experience. The least important thing. Okay? But and he, he believed in what he could do, and he knew something. If you give them quality service, they'll keep coming back. But then there was a problem. He got the building, he got the theaters. Anybody been to the multiplex theaters? Kind of nice, now Thanksgiving, remember, he didn't build that one, okay. But they're good, they're nice. I'm gonna reveal a secret to you. Real butter. Real butter, yes. Uh, what do you like about, the most about Larry Miller's theaters compared to other theaters? Okay, do you know when he did reserve seats? Bruce, help me out here. A year ago? No, it was about three years ago because he had somebody who would rent theaters from him and um, that person got the three to 400 people in and out in less than 15 minutes. And the uh, manager asked that person, how do you do this? I mean, you, you've been to other theaters, they have the big long lines, chaos and mingling and you know, who's where and what and why and how. How are you getting a full theater completely in? And we noticed that our popcorn sales are going up, so they're in that line too. How are you doing this? And I'll have to be honest with you, I showed him the tickets that I printed out that have the map on the back of the theater. These are the seats that they're sitting in, and they just know where they're going on, they don't worry about it, and they just go in and sit down, and then they leave. Three months later, that manager was promoted, and they went with the idea of reserved seating. I should have gotten a percentage. Anyway, but yeah, that's one of the things that they did. They innovated that way, okay? And the big thing is, is Larry Miller didn't know anything about it. He couldn't even show first run movies at first. Did you know that? He had to go get the, you know, the dollar theater stuff and he had to go get the, the, the Mary Poppins for the 45th time and things like that because the movie theater, the distributors wouldn't even sell to him. What's funny is then, after one year, they started sending their people to him to be trained on how to do it. So, there's a good one too. Any, any of those? So, nice to have somebody local, right? Yeah. Everybody asks, why don't I work for Disneyland? Have you ever been to LA? Driven in it? That's why I don't work in Disneyland. Have you ever been to Florida? Yeah. It's humid. Extremely stifling. That's why I don't work there. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, I'll take that as a hint. Bruce, I think I'm done. <laughs> I better be. Now, if you have anything, there's my email address. <laughs> oh. Thank you, sir. The world's greatest speeches oh. for you in audio and in book form. Thank you. Thank for you very here. much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.